paintings are usually barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> so, so that being said, we're going to now begin talking about paintings. The other one was Matisse, who said, if you want to be a painter, remove your tongue. You should express yourself only with your brush. So here are these two guys, you know, they're right up here really, uh, telling me these things. And uh, uh, there's a certain something about truth in what they say. Because a painting is, paintings uh, reflect a language, a silent language. And there's a great book by Andre Malraux, the French art historian, called The Voices of Silence. And if you haven't read that, you should get it out of the library because it talks about the whole history of painting. And this guy knows what he's talking about. The Voices of Silence. Now, my paintings are really of a confession. I confess, this is what I do, this is who I am, this is what I love. And with that kind of an approach, when you confess, uh, there's little room for cover-ups, and I like that. So I don't think a painting should ever have any part of it covered up. So, well, I'm gonna push that over to the side. I'm not going to pay, I, that doesn't work over there. It should be a totally open, honest, free expression. Uh, somewhat like the approach that a child would have, because our real mentors are children. Uh, children are uninhibited, free, they don't judge, uh, they don't worry. They have no fears. I'm talking about when it comes to painting. Of course they have fears. They might fall down the steps or something. But what I'm saying is that children are our guides. And to go back to Picasso, he said, and I quote, all my life I've tried to be like them. Children. So uh, listen up and look up when you see work by children. Because it's, they're always wonderful. Now, they're not professional artists. They don't have that development and have not enough life experience to make art that's uh, professional. I hate that word professional, by the way. But what other word do we have? Um, but they are, they are miraculous. And we need to pattern ourselves after them. We need to look back at our childhood. Because I believe, as I said this morning, uh, that we're all born geniuses. When we're born, we're all geniuses. We can do anything. We're children of the universe. And the universe is on our side. It wants us to succeed in whatever we do. And then what happens? Life starts to happen to that genius. And that bright light that's in your belly starts to get covered up with the garbage of life, I would call it. You know, the things that, oh, we've got to watch what we do. we got to follow this rule we have. Sorry. So, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> the garbage yeah, yeah, so it's true. And, and you have to realize that everyone in this room has the total potential to be an expressive artist. You know, I believe it. I've had students of mine who came in and never had done anything. And that was a plus, by the way, that they were completely free of, of having any bad habits. And uh, it ended up like uh, this doctor, the old man that I had, he was he's like 85 when he started. And uh, I'll get his name in a minute. Um, and he did wonderful works, wonderful primitive paintings. He loved painting. And I said to him, uh, why is it that you're, you're doing, what, what, what's this thing with you with doing painting now at 85? Why? He said, well, what else would I do? I'm tired out, but what else can I do? You know, and that is a real human expression, you know, a real human feeling, rather than give me some idea of, oh, well, I'm painting because right, I saw all these wonderful works and I'm not going to emulate what I thought. None of that. It was all personal, it was all direct, it was all like childlike. And he ended up having a one man show at the art center. 
beautiful reproduced portrait, self-portrait on it. Anyway, Jacob Friedman. And uh, what a wonderful man. When it came to art, I don't know anything else about his life, but when it came to his art, he was totally in charge of self-expression. And that, all, after all, is what my confession is about. <coughs> self-expression. That's the top of the list. Uh, if I don't feel it, I can't do anything. If I don't have an emotion, I'm, I'm dead in the water. So you have to wait. I remember my barber said to me, you know, that's the thing. If you don't have an idea, wait, wait, it'll come to you. It's like meditation. You know, when you meditate, you open yourself up and you have a problem or something you want solved and you announce that. I want to know how to do this. And then you just sit and open up. It's amazing. In comes the answer. You know, it may be an hour, it may be two days down the road, but eventually, answer will come if you're open and free. What do I do when I paint? Okay, I do the best I can. Um, I, uh, as a painter, I'm a traditionalist. Now, some people will say, particularly young artists will say, tradition, man, hey man, get rid of the tradition. I want to do something wild and new. I don't need that tradition stuff. Sorry about that, but that's the way they tell all the time. <laughs> and uh, I know of no artist that was ever worth his salt or her salt that wasn't totally aware of what happened before they came on the scene. I mean, totally aware. How can you pass up Rembrandt? How can you put him in a throw oh, well, that's out? That's 1600, forget it. This is alive today, it was as the day it was painted. All of his paint. And then his etchings. Wow. Think of all the etchings he did. It's unbelievable the, the, the ability that this man had to be consistent all through his life. And never had a downer. He was always up top and doing miraculous work. How could that be? Well, he was physically very strong. That's an important thing. So tradition, I think, is a must. Tradition is a must. And so when you look at these paintings, what are, what are, what are some of the traditions that I'm working on? Uh, first of all, I acknowledge the flat surface. Everything I'm doing is on a flat surface. Now, in the school, the academy, the uh, sculpture students would talk to the painting students and say, you know, we're greater than you. <laughs> you know why we're better than you are? Because we hold the material in our hands. I hope you are you. I, 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 that's coming. <laughs> so, he said, you know, we hold uh, wood, glass, steel, stone. We, we have everything right there. And you guys are fakers. Because all you do is an illusion on the flat surface. It's got a flat surface. But as time goes on, and as I become closer to that flat surface, I realize that it has limitations. And within those limitations comes freedom. You know what you can do and what you can't do. And I love the artist that says, I do what I can, not what I want. I can't do what I want. I do what I can. That sounds like a very simple thing, but that, that is so profound if you're involved in the creative process, to do what you can as opposed to what you can. Be familiar with what you can do. So I look at the flat surface and I honor it and I love it. There was a teacher friend of mine who had a class of children and he said this little girl, <laughs> before she would paint, she would pick up her paper Give it a big kiss. <laughs> and I thought that, you know, that there it is. There's the children. She knew, that, hey, this is it. This is my limit right here. Mwah, I love you. So I acknowledge the flat surface, and on that flat surface, I create the illusion of form. And the illusion of form and movement. I'll put it up there and point out some of this. Thank 
you. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. And I had a, a, a student, his name was Jeffrey Shapiro, a very talented man. Uh, said, what do you mean movement? Everything on there is still. What do you mean? They, yeah, what do you talk about movement? Well, everything in these paintings have a relationship of form in space that takes on various pulls and pulls and pushes and movements. So that uh, if I look at, say, the first painting there, uh, I think that uh, I, I really worked on that a long, long time. This didn't come. Sometimes a painting comes and it's a blessing and you're in bliss. But uh, most of the time that doesn't happen. You have to dig. And so with this, uh, I had her face back, lying like this. That was the idea that she was uh, almost reclining over the chain lounge there. And, uh, and for some reason, it just didn't sit there. Uh, it, it bothered me, and I don't know why. But my feelings told me, uh-uh, not going. So and I stood her up. I stood her up. Uh, then in the relationship of the window, she has a more geometric form here, sitting uh, in relation to the chaise lounge and the pillows, and then the table comes forward. So there's a spatial relationship. The table, and I use the cast shadows, keep your eye on that table so it doesn't run off. But one of the things I like particularly about this painting is the variety in paint. The variety in paint. Instead of this being a solid color, it's, it's full of texture and variety, and I want more of that uh, in my painting. I want a, a great painter by the name of Franklin Watkins, Philadelphia painter, said, paint may alter life, it may increase life, but it is paint, and it must stay paint and reduce life to painted terms. Now, what he's saying is, it has to stay paint. What do you think he means by that? It's paint and it has to stay paint. Well, here's what he means. You start say you're going to paint an apple and you make that apple appearance to be almost photographic. And the paint, because you're making this, uh, the appearance as number one aspect, uh, the paint is sec secondary. The paint has to step aside and let the eye the Trump oil, is that what you call it? Uh, show the actual proof. So I'm finding that paint will lead me into unchartered expression. And uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm now anxious to do. So this painting now I think is a spatial unity, even with a little building out the side, which takes you beyond the window. Uh, one of my favorites here, so maybe I shouldn't say that, but it really is this one. Now I took this to a framer out on the main line, and it's the first time it ever happened to me. When the frame, the frame, frame was finished, and a new worker, I had never seen her, a framer uh, before, came out with this painting, and she handed it to me. Sick. That's a beautiful painting. Hmm. Oh, boy. Well, what kind of a what kind of, could you get a better comment from somebody? And she was an artist because she, you know, artists get jobs in framing houses. But I really think it is. I think she's right. Uh, because if you look at this as a spatial unit, which is what it is, you see the movement of the table. Then the still life on that table. Let's believe it. And then she is nice and properly placed behind the still life. And then, of course, you have the pillow and the chair, which works to fulfill this space. See, that every part of the flat surface demands attention. Every part is equally important. If you put a grid over this painting, black lines, 
terrible thing to do, has blocks all equal size. That block up here is just as crucial as the one on her face. It has to have a unity. What does Cezanne say? The benevolent god of painting said, my purpose is to unify the illusion of form and the flat surface. That's it. That's it. That's the whole business right there. So I think, and also out the window, that the, the spatial relationship will start here, here, moving over to here, and then out the window. So that it's not a flat surface, but it is simultaneously. Okay? Um, the one that was on the cover when uh, Rosita, is that the way pregnant? How, how do you pronounce your name? Rocio. 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 I'll never learn. That's all right, don't worry about anyway, it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, she did that sidewalk out there. <laughs> Quite miraculous. And anyway, uh, I think this one has uh, some of the same quality as the one below. Uh, the table moves you in. The, the, uh, see, it's a motif. See, when Cezanne was out by the big mountains, and he had his paint, uh, his canvas strapped to his back, and carrying his uh, easel and some rocks on strings, so that when he set his evil up, easel up, that the rocks on the string would hold the wind from blowing it over. He had an idea, in fact, a very good concept of what the traditions of art demand terms of painting, in terms of that flat surface, before he found a motif to paint. He's walking, he's looking, and when he sees sky, mountain peak, uh, buildings coming forward, a stream, he sees all the things that, yes, that's going to be in keeping with what I know it needs. So I, I, I've come up with this statement by Robert Finch saying, if you don't know what to look for, you don't know what you're seeing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a, certain, there's a certain thing that a child coming in to look at a painting is gonna take it all in and know it all because they're innocent mm -hmm. and they're receptive, but they can't realize that Five minutes later, Matisse remembered, and so did Cezanne five minutes later. So I think this has that movement of the table, the movement of the figure, and some bright person that was looking at this, Ken, my friend, said that, and I never dreamed of this, but that the form of the hand and the arm is reflected in the flowers and the bays. And those kind of things happen subconsciously. And most of the painting happens subconsciously. In fact, I was going to say, that's my ambition, is to paint a painting that is totally subconscious, that I haven't had one thought about it. It's been all just emotion and feeling. That's what Van Gogh said. He said, I want people that look at my paintings not to be able to figure out how I did them, but just to know the emotion that I felt. What a great painter. Don't pass up Van Gogh. Uh, here again, we have the uh, lady laying down. Now, most of these drawings, uh, paintings come from uh, drawings that I do. And when I start to draw, I have to be happy. I can't draw if I'm tired, and I can't draw if I don't have a good feeling. If I have a good feeling, I sit down with a pack of paper and a book underneath it and a piece of cardboard cut to the proportion of this, but small, so that I lay that down. That's the only conscious thing that I do, to lay that down. And then I pick up a pen, and you see these drawings over here uh, are evidence of what I'm saying. I pick up the pen and put it on the paper, and then I watch. I disconnect and I walk. And if I have a thought, I stop immediately, go get a cup of coffee. If I start thinking, that is no doubt. 
<laughs> I know. Thinking is the worst enemy for an artist. Now I had a, I was going with a, uh, who said make this sh talk short. Uh, I was going to a uh, wedding with a guy who taught at Temple, uh, an English professor, very brilliant guy. And I said I, uh, to my students, I said, when they come in, I said, leave your intellect at the door when you're coming into my drawing class. Uh, he went into a rage. <laughs> How can you say that? The intellect is, the, the, we, we, where would we be without our intellect? It's the whole human race right there. We got to have the intellect. But I wish. I said it anyway. Because art is not interested as science and math <laughs> in facts. Art takes the fact and then plays with it and does tricks with it. And so um, the one on the lower right, I was pleased with that because of her arm, the relationship of the two arms. <laughs> make a kind of a geometric form content there. She's up front, she's sitting on the chaise lounge, and then there's a wall in back of her. And that's the next step back. Then we go to the three trees, or four trees, and we go off into the distance. And all of that is kept comfortably on the flat surface. So that's really what I'm doing. It's making a harmony, and balance all those words that you hear that mean nothing as words, but have to be experienced. I like the one in the upper right because of this, this is what I'm talking about, uh, the, the drapery, the, the flowers, and all this is non-existent in, in, the, in the real world. This is all just on my head from a little drawing. And then I don't copy that. I use the emotion of that drawing and project in there. But then we have the plate. I love putting the plate in back of the flowers because it makes the plate exist. And then the movement, Jeffrey Shepard, nothing moved. The movement of that figure and her arm. And then the pillow that functions to complete that space, the overall space. Uh, If you have a question or you'd like to say something, go ahead. Uh, what I've come to really admire about these is they're deceptively complex. When you first see them, you think they're very simple and, oh, there's an outline and, uh, you know, a couple of architectural features and the color. And then the more you look at them, the more they realize, I realized how many layers of thinking or feeling you were putting on them. Well, thank you for being a good viewer. <laughs> I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, yeah, it takes years. It takes your whole life. That's the one thing I will say. Painting's very hard because, uh, you know, Cezanne said, could painting be a priesthood? <laughs> And you know how limited priests are, at least they're supposed to be. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's the story of these paintings. Here we have this motif here. I like this one uh, with the table. I use the table a lot. I'm a little worried about that, but uh, I'll get off of the table and do other things. But I like the table in relation to the figure, in relation to my backyard. I see that every day in the French tours. And I just like the movement of the figure. I like the way it sits. I think it belongs on that canvas. And um, I feel good about it, which is rare. Over here, uh, uh, yes. Can you tell us about your materials? Like how do you, like this piece on the, the two, on the top right hand side, yeah. it seems to have a different grid, a different yeah, kind that's of uh, right. a handling. Well, yeah, well that's a wash. That is not oil paint. Wash, mm. tempera paint, uh, the oldest painting medium known to artists. I bought the two on the top or just the one? The two the on the top. The top. They're both wash. Okay. They're and very, the rest of them are oils? The rest are oils. Only very oil? True. What's that? Only oil. Only oil. What do you mean by that? Oil and well, this, this, Does this have something 
like graphite or some other yes yes so it's wash and graphite yeah uh -huh. anything else any other mediums that you use ah oh, not that i can think of right at the moment i use uh, i like to use uh lisso pencils sometimes in with that's like a waxy uh, yeah a waxy pencil uh -huh. i like the texture of that line mm -hmm. over here we have a painting that i did uh as many pointed out, that it's an entirely different genre than these because it's done maybe eight years ago, ten years ago. Uh, of a young woman, she was young then, she's not young anymore. <laughs> but she uh, came, this was done in the class that I was teaching. And uh, I decided to work that night. It was a three hour class. These people, Hey, you did it all in three hours. Well, she just dragged a hold of my emotions that I couldn't. Everything was spilled out for me before I started. All I had to do was be there and I could look around, have a cup of coffee, have a painting, and it would all come together. So that wasn't from a drawing? No, no, that was not. That's entirely different. Uh, as I say, this is out of context with the other. When do you work on those? When? Is this uh, later? Every day I get this up is at 5 a.m. No, no, I mean like that. this was done eight years ago, so those are more recent. These are all recent. Ah, okay. Yeah, the 15, 16, right? What's that? 2015 and 16. 15, yeah, they're recent. I've seen some of the... These last three that years. Oh, okay. So that piece took you... Three hours. Three hours. Three hours. That's phenomenal. And I also won an award with that, by the way, cutting yeah. my foot my back Yay. here. Yay! What's the fastest thing? At the uh, Shelby yeah. Dem Art Center, they gave me a special yeah. award for that painting, and I'm very delighted. Uh, but that doesn't make the next painting, getting an award doesn't make the next painting any easier. <laughs> tell, tell them about how when you tried to do another one, remember? You were, you oh, yes. Uh, you tried this to replicate. inspired me. And inspired the people that looked at the painting. So many people told me, "Oh, look at that yeah. defiant!" You know, <laughs> the the you know I'm, I'm, I'm black, but I'm as good as anybody else, and black lives count, and all of that. <laughs> and she had that all in that pose. It's wonderful, and we love her. Uh, but I said, "Okay, I really had success here. So if you come on back, Cynthia, I want to use you again." So I got her back in the studio, she went to sleep. <laughs> I couldn't get her to pose again with any of this that she had going on there. We tried and tried, and it just didn't work. So, so we did the one. 